I left my ring home. No. <laughs> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for blessing this words, and I'm going to speak to my brothers and sisters here. Thank you that we get to meet in a wonderful place with friendly people that is sunny and warm. Two days of driving to gain 30 degrees is pretty nice. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done and everything that you will do and for showing us more and more truths about who you are by how we're created. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Well, what I'm going to be talking about today is a graph of the brain coupled with my personal testimony. Because what I'll be sharing is very personal to me. See, it isn't just something I've studied in a book. It's something that I've lived. Because you see, when you have experienced intense suffering because of the lack of relationships with your parents, it kind of takes you to like the foundation of your brain, you know. The brain is kind of like water on top of rocks at the bottom. And we all have, you know, bumpy rocks at the bottom. And because we all have a fallen nature, we all have parents who weren't perfect. And sometimes they made big mistakes, at times more than one. And so, when that water is high, you don't notice it so much. When you have other things go wrong in your life, the water drops, and like the boat of your heart begins to bump on the rocks at the bottom. Well, I had a lot of rocks, and my parents made mistakes, and I realized I have to know how I can escape this situation. Because I want to be a good person, I want to follow God. But my parents believed lies about God that caused our home to be quite painful. Basically, I was raised in a home where my father believed that emotions were sin. And so I was raised to think, if I get upset about something, then I've sinned, and so I should stuff my emotions sure. so that I don't sin by expressing them. And my father, he believed that, and he also modeled that. And my mother was very expressive. She was more controlling, and this caused me to have fear of my mother and a love for my father. But my father was fearful of my mother, so the person that I trusted was overpowered by the person who I was afraid of continually. Mm. And so that's basically a little picture of how my home was. And we were in this community that was conservative, so we focused on the people who aren't like us are less righteous than we are, so I was afraid of them. You know, I was afraid to associate with most people because I thought they're not good people because they're doing things I don't agree with, they don't eat the right foods, you know. You have to be vegan or your crown is going to get dimmer, you know. This is the kind of extreme views that I had, you know, where you have a security with God because of how you act. So when you have that view, you can't talk about the things on your heart, you know. When I was eight years old, my parents punished me for witnessing to my neighbors. I think I've said that to about half of you so far. And so the result was, I felt that to trust God and to be saved, I had to disown my parents. Mm -hmm. And that's at the age of eight. So, until a year and a half ago, this pain wasn't resolved. And my experience was, whenever I would try and get close to my earthly father, my heavenly father seemed to feel farther away, and vice versa. And so when I go over here to connect to my heavenly father, my earthly father feels further away, and there was that dissonance. I want both, but whenever I reach for both, I seem I feel like I'm being split in half, basically. Because the way the brain works is if you have an early traumatic experience, a lie often goes into the right brain. Because you see, this is your left brain here, this is the left hemisphere. And this is the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is divided into four levels. And at level one, you can write this in your notes, well in May, it takes me a minute to write with this chalk, and it doesn't look very good, but that is the thalamus. This is the amygdala. The rest I'll just explain about these. This is 
the cingulate cortex. I'm going to cover these several times so you can see how it really affects our lives. And this is the right orbital prefrontal cortex. I'm going to put RH up here. This is the whole right brain. And I'll give this an acronym. This is the R O P C. So basically, everything that you experience in your life. It comes through these four levels of the right brain. The thalamus processes information first, then the amygdala. These two are below your conscious awareness. So these two, depending how they're programmed, are going to affect everything in your life, for good or for ill. And until I got into some information with my dad that brought healing to us, we thought that these two levels were not fixable. This is the cingulate cortex. This is where you share emotional energy states with people. The Bible says, you know, weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice. And so when you're sharing someone's energy state, your cingulate cortex is in sync. Sometimes this can have problems, and it can affect relationships like the person speaks and then someone else speaks and they go back and forth to sense where someone is at in the ebb and flow of conversation can be affected by this if this isn't working properly. This can also be affected by toxins, can be affected by mercury and lead from vaccines, from stress. A lot of the autism that's been diagnosed is mercury in the cingulate cortex from vaccines that affect their ability to relate to people. You clean the mercury out, the symptoms go away. Not in every case, but in some cases. This part of the brain works if these parts are working. This is your personality. This is how you act around people, and this is built by watching someone else do it. When someone comes over to your house and you invite them in, that brain program, how do you greet them, you show them a seat, all these things that you do, you learn from your parents. And either they show you how to do it, or your brain doesn't pick it up. They may tell you that when you encounter a situation, you're still going to act out what your brain is programmed with. Now the reason this is so important is when you're under stress, Everything over here shuts off. All of the Bible texts, everything you've learned. You can read the Bible four hours per day, and if this has bad tapes, the bad tapes aren't changed. That's why it's important to have community, because the Bible teaches your left brain what the truth is. And it also affects the right brain when you imagine in your mind the Bible stories, like David facing Goliath. That can be very helpful because you're imagining I'm a little guy, or a little girl, like David, that by trusting in God, I can overcome this huge problem. That's why the Bible stories are so important, because they reach the right brain. You know, Paul is like the explanations, more left brain. This is the right brain, where you have your training for how you behave in life that actually runs, you know. All of these levels can be fixed, even as an adult, because let me go through like one major example for each. Pain at each level. The thalamus is where it stores the three kinds of bonds you have with people. You have siblings, brothers and sisters, everybody who's a friend feels like that to you. You connect to someone new and they become your friend. It feels the same as if they're a part of your family, because they are, you know. That's what spiritual family is for. And you have those who are older who feel like parents, or younger they feel like children. That's the second kind of bond. Like when I meet kids, I'm old enough to be a father, and I think, wow, if I was a father, I'd love to have a kid that was that sweet, you know, and then to raise them and be part of them as they grew up. I mean, I'm now 40 years old, so I could technically have a 22-year-old child if I had a child at 18, which is four years older than the oldest of you teenagers there, and I'm thinking, man. Where have the years gone? I was just you guys' age yesterday. You know? it's, just, it's like, enjoy every day because, as the rest of you can attest, the older you get, the faster time goes. You know? Because each day is a smaller and smaller proportion of your whole life. You know? When you've lived for one year, one year, one day is a big chunk. When you've lived for 60 years, one day it's 5 p.m. almost before you get up and you think, what happened? You know. So the third bond is the husband-wife bond. Interesting thing about this is it's designed to be in 
the image of God. And so when you connect to somebody in that way, it's a mutual connection between a man and a wife. And because it's designed to be to an opposite gender person, if you dig into this part of the brain, and you look at what happens in homosexuality, it doesn't fit. Because have you ever taken two magnets? You have a magnet here, and they have a positive and a negative end. And then, a po positive and negative, positive and negative. So you take two magnets, positive and positive, repel. To use the example, like two men for example, they repel, doesn't match. Negative and negative, repel. two women, doesn't match. But if you go like this, they attract, you know. Right. And that's how the brain is designed. You know, you can have a male or female parent, you can have more than one. My mother passed away. There's four women who feel like mothers to me in my life. And I can have as many as I would like, and same with fathers, you know. Because we all know situations where a parent passed away, we have a stepfather, you know. You can have many of those. Siblings, 10, 20, 30. When I was in Hawaii, I made about 4,000 friends because I just wanted to love everybody. And I hadn't been very social before that because I was afraid of being contaminated by people who had issues. And then I realized I'm free. There are sheep in different folds and they hear the Father's voice because when I speak with them, they have that light in their eyes. They're loving, they're kind. You know what these hippies in Hawaii believe? They believe, number one, to forgive those that hurt them. Number two, to not run my own life, but let God run it. And number three, to not judge anybody for what they did, but just to love them unconditionally. That's awesome. Aren't those all three biblical principles that every Christian should follow? Yes. Yeah. So basically, they had these right part of the brain working. The thalamus is the people that are personal to me. If I see you and I know you, this part of the brain processes and says, okay, I know who you are to me, I will go to the next level, the amygdala. This is the amplifier of the brain. It amplifies for joy, it can also amplify for pain. When you're driving down the highway and you see flashing lights behind you, your brain says, is this familiar to me? Yes. Do I like it? No. <laughs> so the amygdala either will go into fear or into calmness. I used to take our visa across the country. I think I got pulled over about 20 times because either my license plate was in the wrong place, or I was going too fast, or one time in New York I had to pull over and wait because I went onto a road where the sign said, no commercial vehicles, but I missed the sign. And here I am going under bridges with a curve like this, and I have this big box truck, and I had like three inches to spare, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. So basically my amygdala was able to calm down and say, this is uncomfortable, to be in the presence of these rough police officers, but I'm going to rest and quiet myself because I know God is with me. And after 20 times of practice, when I see the flashing lights now, the amygdala, the thalamus says, familiar, yes. The amygdala says, eh, not bad and scary, I've got God with me. But see, I knew that 20 years ago, but it took practice before my emotions caught up. See, this is the thing with Christianity. There's things that you know, and then things that you know in your intellect, and then there's things that you know in your emotions. And God's plan is to get our emotions to agree with our intellect. And sometimes that takes years, you know. You read the Bible text, you know, that says, um, there's a song that goes anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go, but it says, you know, where can I go from your presence? Um, though I make my bed in hell, you are there. But I make my bed upon the far parts of the sea, you were there. So God is always there, but we all have times where it feels like he isn't. And that's because our right brain at some level had an experience either with a parent, often likely, or with another person where there was a lack of safety, and that affects the rest of our life. Because if you have an experience, it's traumatic. For the rest of your life, everything that you experience after that, that is similar to that, your brain reacts the same way. It doesn't matter whether it's the same situation or not. It just has to be similar. Like when I was a child, my mother forced me to take swimming lessons, which I didn't enjoy. I only realized 20 years later, it wasn't the water that bothered me, it was the teacher. Because mm. it was like, if you're going to push me into something I'm afraid of, 
And if I'm nervous, and I can't tell you that I'm nervous, or you might tease me, I'm kind of stuck. If I go this way, I go into the water, or I fear drowning, because I'm not sure that you're going to watch me carefully enough. If I go this way, you'll be upset at me because I may tell you, I can't even look at the water today, so I need space, you know. It was the feeling of being out of control with a teacher who had a plan for me, and if I didn't like it, I didn't have any way out. Like going on the train and you see the cliff. You know the train's going over the cliff, and there's no way to get off because the train's doing 60 miles an hour. That's how I felt. So when I was in Hawaii just a few years ago, this lady had me practice in the ocean in a calm area with a surfboard across this way, and I could put my body like this and kick and paddle. I didn't swim very well. I made about five inches of progress in 40 seconds. But uh, I lost my fear of the water because I realized I got the board, and the lady was not pushing me. There's a fourth trait those hippies had too. They all had a very good singular cortex. If I had a simple expression of, oh, you know, I'm not sure I like this, they understood, you know. And it taught me there are people who will be able to tell if I don't like something and I can say no, I don't have to say yes. And that was a big breakthrough too. Because my brain had been trained when something <coughs> scary comes your way, there's no way out. You can't say no, you have to do it. And I realized, I can tell the person, you know, I'd love to go with you to this gathering, but I'm busy or I'm hungry, you know. Because I would like go like 10 hours without eating because I would think I don't want to offend this person by saying no. And so some of my basic habits of life didn't get installed when I was growing up, you know. But at the same time, I was spending four hours a day in scripture and I could go into theology super deep. But I didn't know how to live my life. I didn't know how to properly feed my body. I didn't know how to make friends. That was a classic example of somebody who could talk the talk, left brain, but couldn't walk the walk, right brain. First time in my life when I felt that I was really peaceful with myself was probably just in the past few weeks. You see, I'm a work in progress, and so what I'm describing here, it isn't just a theory. For me, it's what I live with. You know, I can tell if a level is struggling. Because what happens is, all these levels are hierarchical, which means that if you have pain at a certain level, it shuts off what's above it. So let me give you an example. Suppose you meet somebody who is new, and they don't know how to relate to you. They just uh, give you a book to read. They say, oh, this book is interesting. But they don't get to know who you are. And so you think, I have all these things I want to say, but I don't know what to say to them. Your left brain can turn off because you don't feel the connection is mutual. Take it one level down. If the person can't synchronize with you, you're going to feel that your personality is hindered. It was like, oh, you know, welcome, you know, here, take this glass, here's some food, eat. You ever been to someone's house where they tell you what to do at every stage, and you find that you've been following their instructions for the past hour and they never asked you what you wanted to do? <laughs> this happens to some people. And when that happens, at the, your level three, your creativity goes out. Like if you're an artist, you may have a hard time knowing what to do, like to paint a picture. Because see, this is where brokenness is as humans. This is what God wants to fix. And when you're in great pain on this side, which is all of us, I mean, after 6,000 years, it's a wonder any of us can function anymore. You know, In Isaiah, it says we are all full of wounds and putrefying sores mm -hmm. with no soundness in it. And so what we realize is, if I realize I have all these weaknesses, and I realize there's hope, then my shame goes away. Because God says, I see all your weakness more than anyone else does, more than you do. But I can help you, I can heal you. And the culture that God wants to set up where it says, I want to put, you can't put new wine into old wineskins. The new wine is the Holy Spirit, the Gospel over here, but also in the right brain. But it applies when you have a community where it's like, this is my problem. I really struggle over here, but over here I have a special ability. This is the other thing people struggle with in some cultures is, if you tell them that you have a problem, 
they think that you just are full of holes and wounds and they won't let you do anything to, con to contribute. They think, oh, if you have issues, you must be one big issue. This happens in the church so much. Or, or you go over here, hey, I have this special gift. I'm good at this. Yeah. How wonderful. We can use you. But then they think that you're good at everything, that you have no problems. <laughs> well, nobody is either. We all have areas of genius and areas where we're just completely flat broke, you know. Yep. <laughs> and in the culture of heaven, you're seen for both at the same time. The way you're really gifted will say, yeah, good job, you have a special gift from God. We're going to give you a place to use your gift. At the same time, you're wounded over here. We'll be sensitive to you over here because some of us are very good here, but not good here. Some of us are very good here, but not here. When I realized that I had a problem, there was a psychologist, his name was Dr. Jim Wilder, and he gave a lecture the first weekend of November, 2003, and it changed my life, because my dad realized this is what's wrong in our home. We're all deep into the Bible, we all understand God deeply, we all know the Gospel, but we can't relate to each other. I'm an only child. Our home alternated between a little bit of joy and a lot of stress. Every time I had a need, my parents would have conflict because my parents never had the same idea about anything. And my mom had this idea and dad had this idea. And he would say, okay, honey, you do your thing. But I would think, you have a better idea for what's good for me, dad. But he would always default to her and now is like, you know what I need, but I'm getting what she wants, which is not what I need. And that happened to some degree, every day for decades. Wow. Just imagine that. And so I thought, well, if I don't have any needs, if I just get my love from God instead of my parents, you see, then I'm going to be okay because I'll be able to bypass their weaknesses. And I can trust God, and I can grow up and be holy and righteous, and their weaknesses will have no effect. And when I realized that I needed the same people that were hurting me, I almost fell apart. It was like, I can't take this, God. Why did you give me these parents? I was very angry at God. And it took me a while to realize I was created to need people. And just because we have friends with issues doesn't mean we don't need friends. And then I realized that we are like the glove on the hand. Jesus is the hand and I'm the glove. And everybody who believes in him, and others too who I met, who saved my life in Hawaii, they want to be used by God, and they're hoping that when they submit to Him, something in their life will be a blessing. And they're hoping someone will say, I see Jesus in you, your desire to be a blessing we can see, you know. Because some people go to their graves and are never sure if in all their praying and work if they made one dent in this world's pain, you know. People need affirmation, you know. And when we realize that, we can clearly see that this is what God is focused on. Now in about 10 minutes I'll give you a text that was so encouraging to me and at the same time so shocking that I'll tell you metaphorically, put your seat belts on because when my dad and I saw this connection we thought, you've got to be kidding me. Why isn't everyone talking about this? It's the big secret that changed our lives. Now let me go here to the amygdala and the thalamus because these are the ones that hurt the most but they provide the most help. See, the amygdala is also the guard shack. And what it's meant to do is when you have a painful experience, it prevents more things from happening. Like suppose you get to the edge of a cliff, your knees feel a bit weak, and you're joking with your friends, and people start pushing each other, and you come close to falling over, but you don't. The amygdala says, oh, cliffs are bad and scary, so you're going to feel more afraid when you're by a cliff for the rest of your life than before. It's a protection mechanism. When I was around swimming pools and there were pushy people, I wanted to get away because I wanted to talk about physics and theology. They wanted to just wave their arms and dive in the pool and laugh and be silly and, in my view, completely waste their time, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's why I didn't fit in growing up. I didn't have any shared interests. I mean, I was somebody that wanted to like, get up front and speak since I was 12. It was like, I want to share things about God but I had to learn, before you get up and share, first you have to have an experience. First, you have to learn to love everybody and stop measuring people by how smart you think they are, by any classification or qualification. 
And now that I realize that everybody is family to me, whether they know it or not, whether I know it or not, then God says, okay, now you can use your gift because now you're going to be a blessing and not a curse, you know. I mean, because if God gives you a gift but you're not emotionally healed, that gift can cause pain to other people, you know. And I want to make you, to help you be more of who God wants you to be, you know. Not more of who I think you should be, you know, which may not be the same thing. Not, you know, to make you conform, you know, to anybody except Christ. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which means a new culture, a new way of seeing things, you know. Because if we're really family to each other, then all of us have parents, all of us have issues. If we're married, all of us can have challenges because our partner is not a clone of us. But the joy is that we're showing a demonstration of love, whether it's, you know, a spouse or a friend or a parent. My dad and I couldn't connect very well years ago. It was five years ago I went seven months without calling him because I was working at this farm that he thought would be a help to me. But the guy had a problem. He would yell. And when he would yell, my amygdala would say, I remember when my mother yelled when I was nine years old. Embarrassing experience in second grade. And I wanted to run and hide. And she yelled at me for 45 minutes. See, that's what happened to my amygdala. My own mother, my thalamus said, do I know this person? Yes, she's my mom. What do I feel about her? Bad and scary, I want to run. But the problem was I lived with her. So if your amygdala is set against somebody in your own home, that can be agony because you keep meeting them. If you notice, if you live with somebody in the same house, when you get up in the morning, you keep running into them. It just happens. So, if this can be healed, as it was with my mom to a large degree, it's wonderful, you know. How can I learn to love the things I once hated? How can I learn to hate the things I once loved? Well, here's the solution for the amygdala. Because there are some people where, when they meet a Christian, their thalamus says, is this relevant to me? Yes, they're talking about God. Opinion? Bad and scary. And that's before they even think a single thought. So, if people have right brain issues, the key thing to know is you cannot change the programming of any of these levels by talking about it. The left hemisphere, you need an answer? I've got an answer for you. This is the fun level, this is the safe level that most churches are stuck in. Right over prefrontal cortex, this is how to behave. This learns by watching somebody. If you were shown examples for how to deal with conflict in your home, or how to approach God, or how to evangelize, or how to make friends that doesn't work for you, or that God isn't leading you to, God will bring you a friend who will show you a new program, and that overwrites the old. That's how you fix wrong tapes in your mind. You know, when you have a situation, you have a habit, how you approach something. Here's an example. Like when I would get up in the morning, I had this thought, if I don't spend time with God, I'm going to have a rotten day. But I'm also a free spirit. I want to experience God in the Bible, and talking to my dad, and walking outside like in this beautiful sunshine, you know. I love nature. There are basically three books to experience God. The Bible, your family, and nature. And ideally, all three are pleasant for you. When I'm walking on a beautiful trail in the mountains, with a good friend talking about God, that's heaven for me, you know. Like if I was to hike with you up and down Mount Lacant four times in one day, that'd be heaven for me, you know. Let's try it. <laughs> and I think you could do that four times in one day, you know, what you told me. So, the amygdala is programmable when Oh, the singular cortex. This basically just requires practice. If people tell you that you can't synchronize with them very well, all you need to do is ask God to bring you a friend who has this skill, and you'll suddenly find your brain picks up that skill from their brain. Once you have that skill, you never lose it. If you still have a hard time synchronizing, you need to ask yourself, is this because of stress or fears I have? Because if you're always tense, which I've often been in my life, 